Well, as everybody is uh, coming in and finding their seats, we're going to go ahead and get started. And let me, on behalf of the uh, elders, pastors here, just wish uh, all of our visitors, many of them here tonight, uh, a hello and welcome. We're glad to see many of you out here uh, joining us here at the Reformed Baptist Church in Riverside. Um, we're going to begin now. I know the ushers are still trying to help get packed in, so if you have an extra seat next to you, feel free to let the usher know, hey, this seat is open. And uh, for the parents who are here, if you've got real little ones, two and under, we have a nursery, my right, and up the stairs, you can put them in a nursery there. Or we actually have a cry rooms right here. Ask one of the ushers, they can help you get in there if you need to help take care of a crying baby. And if you kids get a little too squirmy, we totally understand. You're welcome to stay here. We, our kids stay in with us. But if you just need a little break, just down to the left, uh, your right down the ramp here, we have an overflow area with a TV and a little more open area there. You're welcome uh, to sit down there. Um, let's open uh, as we uh, uh, look at uh, Psalm 130 here just to begin our time together. It says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord... Who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all of his iniquities. I was just looking at a new biography about John Newton. At the very end of it, at the very end of his life, he says, My memory is nearly gone, but two things I remember, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so grateful for your mercy and your grace. Father, we're thankful that you sent your Son to be the great Savior that great sinners like us need. We pray tonight as we gather to hear your word proclaimed, as we gather to sing praises to your holy name, that you would come and abide with us, that your spirit would minister to us, Lord. Convict us of sin, encourage us in our walks, and may you be glorified in our midst tonight, we pray. And we ask this in your most precious name, in the, in the most precious name of Jesus, amen. So would you stand with me as we sing our first song together, Jesus, I Come to You.
For those of us who heard Jesus say, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are those not the sweetest words we ever heard? And the great truth is that in this walk with him, in this life, it can get difficult. It can be challenging, but we can trust he will hold us fast. He is the good shepherd, and he has never lost one of his sheep. Let's continue to worship our amazing Lord now. Take your seats for our evening prayer tonight. We're going to just uh, lift up one future missionary. Um, our church is, uh, in just a couple months, about ready to send out a missionary uh, to Spain. His name is Alex Torres, and many of us here in the body have gotten to know him almost for the last year. Pastor Robert will come here in a moment to just give a little bit of a background on it, but uh, we were just reflecting on the amazing providence of God of how he brought Alex into our midst, and it's been a real blessing to get to know our brother. Uh, he is from Monterrey, Mexico, but the Lord put a real burden on his heart uh, to go to Spain, uh, Malaga, Spain, which is kind of on the uh, Mediterranean southern side of uh, Spain. Actually, as you hear in a moment, those who are visitors, Pastor Robert from Scotland, his favorite uh, football team actually spends, I guess, their version of spring training down there as they get ready for their soccer season. So it, even that was an interesting providence. So 
We're just going to pray for Alex as he's getting prepared to, to leave, has to get all sorts of documentation together. And to throw into the mix, the Lord has also orchestrated for him uh, a bride that this summer, Lord willing, he will be uh, getting married there as well. So uh, let's just go before our great father and lift up our brother to him. Heavenly Father, we are once again grateful for your mercies towards us. Um, and Lord, we are so uh, encouraged by seeing your hand of providence work in so many ways to bring our brother Alex uh, to us here at RBCR. Uh, Lord, as you've really knitted him in with the elders here and as many others have gotten to know him, the members here, Lord, we, we love our brother. We are thankful for him. We're thankful for his heart for Christ and, Lord, his desire to go to a foreign land, the one that speaks his tongue, uh, still a foreign land, uh, a European land, Lord, and a land that is very hard to the gospel. Uh, Lord, whether it is the uh, entrenched kind of cultural Roman ca Catholicism or just the pure secularism that is there, Lord, it is a, a hard place. But, Lord, we pray that you... Uh, as you send this young man there, that you would use him for your glory's sake, Lord. We're thankful for the church that is already there, that he will go and minister alongside the other elders there. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, really allow Alex to be a blessing to these brothers, Lord, and a blessing to this congregation. Lord, that you would give him unique opportunities to uh, reach out to those in the community with the gospel. And Lord, that he would be a light, Lord, that 50 years from now, uh, the church there and many other churches would look back that you used Alex as a means uh, to bring and advance the kingdom of God, Lord God. And uh, Lord, we know you are able to do these things. We think of our brother David Vaughn in France who uh, went to a very secular nation as well and has labored there for 30 years, Lord, and the stories of those who've come to Christ, the churches that have been planted, uh, Lord, you are able and so we pray that this young man would be used for your glory's sake and for the advancement of your kingdom. Lord, there's much preparation as he'll be leaving in just a few months. Uh, though we are already sad to think of that, we will miss him. But Lord, we pray that all the things from uh, all the credentials and paperwork that has to be finished. Lord, as he even is preparing to, to be married when he gets there and all that is entailing with that. Lord, would you help these things come together? Uh, would they not be troublesome for him? And Lord, would we be able to uh, very soon here be able to say um, um, adios me hermanos and uh, give him a big hug and uh, cry like the Ephesians did when, the, when Paul left, Lord God, but nevertheless uh, rejoicing that once again you were sending out missionaries for the glory of your name. And so, Lord, we ask for your help in all of these things, and we pray them in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you would stand, we're going to sing just one more song together, coming out of Psalm 121.
please be seated. Well, we're delighted to see you, each and every one. We're thankful that you've come out to worship God and hear God's word proclaimed. And we're very especially glad to have our brother Paul Washer with us. Uh, we trust that the Lord will bless you as you come to preach, brother. This was only arranged on Friday night. Uh, I think it was you, Josh, that we started texting. Uh, so it's a last minute thing. So thank you, brother, for being willing to come. Uh, the folks in LA look on us as the rednecks. So we're, 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 they say that's not LA and we say amen. We're not LA, right? Yeah. But it's just wonderful that you've come. So Brother Paul and Heart Cry, um, a few years ago, our little seminary, Reform Baptist Seminary, we entered into a, an arrangement with them uh, to work in Nepal. And we've been doing that for maybe four years. I think COVID hit us for a year or so uh, with the travel arrangement. And that was the beginning of, uh, you know, being aware of really, oh, wow, what's Heart Cry doing? This is incredible. Uh, and then uh, really about almost 10 months ago or almost a year ago, some of us Reformed Baptist Network guys met you uh, out there in Virginia. I, I really enjoyed that day, by the way. Uh, he's got some really good young men around him that was just a privilege to get to know. Uh, so that was another occasion that we had to get to know Heart Cry. Uh, and then uh, Alex... Uh, we, we call him Alejandro Jesus Torres. That's what he officially is on a Sunday. Uh, he got involved in our lives, and with Heart Cry's partnership, we're going to be sending Alex out uh, to Spain very soon, actually. And that's what Pastor Troy was uh, praying about. So we, we really rejoice in the work of Heart Cry, what our brother's engaged in. We're going to ask you to come, brother. And if you don't mind, give us a two minute or whatever suits you, little update and heart cry, I think a lot of people might not be aware. Uh, so, as you please, okay? But preach the word, brother. God bless you. Well, it is a great privilege for me to be here with you tonight. Um, I started heart cry back in the country of Peru um, in the late 80s, I guess it would be. And um, there we go. And uh, I started it because um, when I went there, I went there kind of by myself. And so the Peruvian brothers there, they became family. And it was during the war with the Sendero Luminoso and social unrest and thousands of people being killed and bombs and terrorism and, and everything. But the church grew. And um, I had the privilege of being with certain Peruvian brothers that had started so many churches, real churches, not just Bible studies, but real churches. And many of them were so poor, they didn't have books, they didn't have materials, uh, transportation. And I began to think, these men are finer men than, than I'll ever be, but how could I help them? And it came down to looking at missions in some ways as simply you looking in your hand and seeing what you have and look in your brother's hand and see what he doesn't have. And so we began working in Peru supporting indigenous missionaries, but through uh, biblical churches. That's a very important point. And um, now it's spread to about 63 countries and there's somewhere around 360 missionary families along with many projects. Uh, also working with the persecuted church um, Last year, we had to uh, smuggle out about 110 Christians from Afghanistan. And so just a lot of works like that. So my main goal is that people know Christ. Um, I do have a people. I have a tribe. I have an ethnicity. And that is everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. That's my people. That's my tribe. And uh, I have the privilege of knowing so many believers all over the world and being taught and learned from so many believers all over the world. Um, the other purpose of Heart Cry, when I became a new believer, someone put a book in my hand. It was the shortened version of the autobiography of George Mueller. And until this day, now it's been 40 years, um, he's, I love all the preachers and the Puritans and Spurgeon, and, but my hero is uh, George Mueller. And uh, I wanted to start a mission organization in which we never told anyone 
our, uh, our need. Uh, we only tell people what we have done or what we are doing, but we never tell anyone our need. And to watch God, um, I would love to say through faithful praying, meet all the needs, but I find very little faithful praying. I just find a great and faithful God. And he has sustained the ministry um, for all these years. And um, he is very kind. Now I am to preach. And to, to do that, um, you must understand something. Um, it is one thing to pick up a Bible every once in a while and, and teach. It's another thing to be a man of God. There is great privilege in that. Privilege in prayer, knowing him, seeing him. Privilege of study, of being able to set aside hours a day to study. But then there's also terrible burden in it. That's why uh, when you read sometimes in some of your translations in Hebrew, oracle, an oracle came from the Lord, or the prophet had an oracle. Uh, the word literally means burden. You see, if this is all real, and it is, if heaven's real, hell's real, life is real, death is real, and when the curtain is drawn back, and that's your reality, it is both a blessing and a terrible oracle, a terrible burden. There are people here in this building tonight that if Christ were to come back, you would find yourself before the judgment throne of God condemned and cast into hell with all of creation standing to its feet and applauding God that he has rid the earth of you. Now, I know that sounds very, very hard, but it's real. It's real. And every time you stand up and preach, it's a matter of life, death, heaven, hell, eternity, mortality, eternal life, eternal death. Where are you? I'm not one of those who's happy because I have dotted every I and crossed every T in some sort of expositional demonstration. I care little about my form. I want to know where are you? Remember when God came into the garden, Adam, where are you? He knew, but Adam needed to know. I don't know, but where are you? Where are you? Church member, child of a fine Christian, but with no faith of your own, where are you? Where are you? Do you love the world and its sin? Are you clinging to Christ and lamenting the fact that you don't love him as you ought? Where are you? Because a great day is coming when you will stand before him. And, and I want to talk about that day for just a moment. If you would look in the book of Revelation. Look in verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. 
Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now I want us to go back to verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, if you look down at chapter 21, you realize that there we have the beginning of the new heaven and the new earth. And oftentimes these two subjects, the great white throne judgment and the new heaven and the new earth are taught separately when, as a matter of fact, you can't understand the judgment apart from what follows in 21. God in his son has determined to create a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth to take us back to the garden, but far beyond the garden. And he's going to do it all in the person of his son, his one and only champion. There's only one hero in this story, and it's Jesus Christ. No one else, no one else, no one else, no preacher, no prophet, no patriarch, all of us have failed. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are lost and weak and impotent and unable to generate any righteousness of our own so that we could stand before God. Impotent, lost. But there is one through whom, through his person and his work, that a new heaven and a new earth will be formed. It is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And not only does he have the power, as he did in the past, to create a heaven and earth, but he has the power to recreate a heaven and earth. And he has the power to populate it by his own blood. By redeeming men and women from their sin through his death on Calvary and on that tree, he accomplished our redemption, not simply by suffering, untold physical suffering, but by bearing the sins of his people and all the holy hatred of God against our evil fell upon him and crushed him. For those three hours in that darkness, wave upon wave of the wrath of God that should be poured out on every one of us was poured out on him. Until he met, met the cost. Until he paid full price for all our crimes and then cried out, it is finished, paid in full. And now that same one who died, he rose again from the dead on our behalf and he ascended up to the right hand of God where he has reigned for 2,000 years. And he will come again. And when he comes again, he will judge the living and the dead. And that's what we have before us here. And after that judgment, he will bring about a new creation. A new heaven and a new earth. But before that's able to be accomplished, something has to happen. He has to rid the earth, heaven and earth, of the great deceiver, the great liar. You can't have a new heaven and a new earth until the father of all lies is cast out forever, eternally separated from creation so he can meddle with it no more. Do you understand me? And so in verse 10, that's what we see. The devil must be cast out before this new creation can begin. But not only him, the false prophet, the beast, must be cast out. But not only them. Some of you must be cast out. You would ruin everything. You don't know Christ. You have a little bit of religion. You don't love him. You don't love righteousness. 
You see, that's what the great white throne judgment is all about. The wicked must be cast out because this new heaven and the new earth, it is only for the redeemed. Now do you see why it is such a burden for the preacher to call out to the congregation and say, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Because if you have not embraced Christ, or better said, Christ has not embraced you. If you do not know Christ, or better said, Christ does not know you. Then you must be put away. Think about that. You. And that if you have not taken Christ, by the time this happens, you will stand before him judged. But here's what you need to understand. Now, even now, if you live in hidden sin, if you delight in evil, you need to understand something. You do that now, but yet still the grace of God restrains your evil. The grace of God still holds you into the category of humanity. He restrains your evil. He keeps it back. He allows you to remain human. Even though you reject him, he still restrains your evil. But on that day, he will pull back from you. There will be no grace at all restraining your evil. And what stands before him is nothing but a sinful creature destined for condemnation, judgment, and eternal ruin. You see, this is <coughs> heaven, hell, life, death. Where are you? Where are you? Will it be necessary for creation to rejoice for you first to be cast out? I said something that may have shocked you earlier. That on the day of judgment, when you take your first step into hell, you will look back and all of creation will be applauding and worshiping God because he has rid the earth of you. What did you think Paul meant when he said all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? That that was a small thing? He condemned the entire world because of one sin. And you have sinned much more than that. Do you see why we have such a need of Christ? Do you see? I have spent 40 years serving him through war, through jungle, through danger, through hunger. But do you realize that if you took the best, most righteous moment of my life and you judged me for that, he judged me for that, I would deserve hell. Right now, if I died, I would go to heaven for one reason. Jesus Christ died for sinners. That's it. Not 99.99% Jesus and 0.01% me. Because even in that 0.01% I fail. If angels that have not fallen, that have not sinned, have to bow their heads to be in his presence and cover their faces with their own wings... If Isaiah, whom tradition tells us, was so devoted to the message, so devoted to God, that he was sawed in two by a wooden saw and yet would not recant the message. If he himself says, I am undone in the presence of this holy God, what do you think it would be like for you? With none of your sin covered and all of it exposed. Sin of deed, sin of mouth. And sin of thought. 
And yes, my dear friend, you have thought things so wicked that if you shared them with your closest friend, they would no longer be your friend. And I know that not because I'm a prophet. I know that because I'm just like you. We're a ruined race. And if we stand before him on that day as a ruined race, apart from his son, there's no hope for the best of us. And certainly not for me. The one thing that is true about every Christian. A Christian can doubt their own salvation. A Christian can struggle with assurance. But a Christian never doubts that if they're going to get to heaven, it is 100 percent through Jesus Christ. Because as the old preacher used to say, you'll not get to heaven with one shred of self-righteousness on your back. You and Jesus don't have your own thing going. It's Christ and Christ alone, even for Paul, even for Paul. And when we read his epistles to the church in Corinth, we understand that maybe no missionary ever suffered for Christ like that man. And yet he knew I'm the chiefest of all sinners, he said. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Christ. Is your hope only Christ? Are you playing this religious game? Are you just moral? Do you have some principles? Are you ethical? Are you an outstanding homeschool child? All of that is rubbish. When you stand before God, all of it is rubbish. The only thing that matters is that he sees the blood and he passes over you. That's all that matters. Why? Why does the preacher talk so much about sin, sin, sin? Because you have to become utterly convinced of your lostness. To, and then look to Christ and find not something in him, not help in him, but everything in him. Everything. When I look back over my 40 years. When I was younger, I sure expected that I would grow more. I expected that by now I would be more holy. I look at my growth chart and I put my head down and I mourn. But there is one area in which I have grown like a skyrocket, and it's because of so little growth. As I have realized year after year, more and more and more, that Christ isn't only all I need. He's all I have. Apart from him, I have no part with God. And the only contribution I have ever made to my salvation is my sin. And the only contribution I've ever made to my ministry is my weakness. It is all Christ. And you must see that all your self-righteousness must just melt. Almost in a Shakespearean way, off me spot, off me I say, off of me I have nothing. Clothe me in Christ, in Christ alone. That's the way it must be, or you will not persevere through this. But if you have Christ, if you truly have Christ, no matter how small you are, how weak you are, you will prevail. No matter how much you've struggled with sin, no matter how much you lament that you love him so little, if you're clinging to Christ and he's holding you in his hand, you will pass through. For those of you who are true saints and you struggle when you look in the mirror, let me tell you this. Jesus Christ didn't come all the way down here and shed his blood on Calvary and suffer the wrath of God and rise again from the dead so that the first time you see him, when you cross through those gates, you see a scowl of disappointment on his face. He'll be happier to see you than you'll be to see him because his capacity for joy is greater. But for those of you who've played with him, oh, my dear. I was just looking at some of the texts in which Christ is in the trial and Pilate says a couple of times, just let me punish him. And he uses a particular verb there, paiduo, which means let me just punish the silly little man. Don't, don't, don't kill him. He's, he's not even worth it. Some of you may do the same thing. Oh, yeah, Jesus. Yeah. 
No, no, no. In the mind of God, he's everything. He's not something. He's not a part of the plan. He's everything. The person and work of Christ is everything. Everything. Now he goes on and he says in verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne. Holiness. Righteousness. Unlike anything you and I could ever fathom. A cleanliness that would disintegrate you. Fracture your mind. Remember the prophet? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each one having six wings. With two they covered their feet, with two they covered their face, and with two they did fly. And one cried out to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him who cried. And the house was filled with smoke. And then said I, Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm ruined, he said. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips. He was fractured in a million pieces. And that wasn't even a glimpse of a glimpse of a glimpse of a glimpse of the holiness of God. You will stand before a throne. Perfect justice. Perfect justice. Many of you have an idea of hell as something of maybe Dante's Inferno, where it's this, this dark and twisted type of punishment where demons are torturing and all sorts of things. Now, what, what you need to understand is that hell will be perfect Justice. Everything you deserved down to the very last cent. And you say, well, that's not too bad. It is when you compare you to him. It will be a perfect justice. No one will be ripped off on that day. Even the condemned, as they're marched into hell, will have to raise their hands and say, the judge of all the earth has done right by me. Then I saw a great white throne. Great. Mega. Extremely large. White throne. And him who sat on it. Now notice, he doesn't really describe the one who sits on it. He talks more about the throne. He used more adjective to describe the throne than the one who sits on it out of mere reverence. There's no way. Language cannot describe him. So you have to turn your eyes from him and describe the thing closest to him, but you cannot describe him. Not in his judgment, not in his holiness, and also not in his love. For some of you, his love. It's like when you look at the beautiful sunset and you say, oh, it took my breath away. What you're saying is its beauty almost killed me. His beauty would. If you weren't strengthened, his beauty would. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. He sat. He always sits. He's not frustrated. He's not nervous. He's not afraid. Even in Psalms 2. When all the nations gather together to come against his throne, he sits and laughs. If all the nations that have ever existed on this planet and the mightiest armies all came together, if all of hell was belched up and all the demonic forces were brought together to join men and they all came against the throne of God, it would be like a little gnat beating its head against a piece of granite the size of the world. goes on and he says, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. I want you to imagine for a moment, and we go back into Old Testament literature, we see that there were angelic creatures, and they're not even referred to as the greatest of angelic creatures, 
who wiped out armies of nearly 200,000 people like that. We know that the devil himself, the whole world, lies in the power of the evil man and he twists nations. We're seeing it in our very day. So I want you to think about this. You, in your own righteousness, you, in your own supposed goodness, you're walking down this immense corridor into the judgment throne, thinking, well, when I get there, I'll tell God. I'll explain my situation. He'll see. But as you draw near, you hear screams. And running in the other direction, almost knocking you down, are creatures larger than the world. And they're fleeing with terror away from the one that you're walking toward. In your self-righteousness on that day, you will melt before him like a tiny, tiny wax figurine before a blast furnace. And then he says, and no place was found for them. I suppose those are some of the saddest words I've ever read. You have no place. Think about it. I've lived long enough to see something of reverence for God, even in secular men. To disdain for God among secular men. To now. For secular men, Jesus is not even important enough to scoff at. They give him no place. On that day, they will be given no place. No place. And I realize with fear and trembling, I could be talking about even some of my own children, relatives, parents, friends. No place. No place. No place. Where do I go? Well, surely there's some makeup work I can do. No. No. And then, now I want to show you the one place where you do. You, you yourself are mentioned in the Bible. John sees you. He does. You're there. Verse 12. And I saw the dead. That's you. That's you. And me. I saw the dead. I have never been able to comprehend. I remember it was uh, just revolutionary in my mind when my father died as a, as a young boy. And I thought him so important. And to sit there in the funeral and even some of his best friends talking about the next basketball game or whatever. That, that men and, and, and his own friends looking in the casket, knowing that they were going to be there soon. And yet it was a trite thing for them. It, even that boulder bashed against their heart could not make them think, I am going to be here too. And now they are. They're all dead. And you will be. And I will be. That's why the old Puritan said, preach like a dying man to dying men and preach as though you'll never preach again. And you may be sitting there right now just holding back the giggle. On the day of judgment, when you stand naked before God, your giggle will be gone. And to be honest with you, I've lived too long to care about your mocking. This is real. It's real. Why do you talk this way? For the same reason he writes, awake sleeper. Wake up. I saw the dead, great and small. Oh, I look at some of the world leaders today and I'm filled with fury when I know what their decisions bring, the heartache and the pain and the death 
that their wicked decisions bring. And I want vengeance for them until I think about what is coming for them. And it makes you want to cry out pity. Because whatever harm they've done on this earth, unredeemed by Christ, they have no idea what awaits for them in hell. No one is so great that they can excuse themselves. No one. And no one is so small that they can hide. We live in a culture when we blame everything on them, them and they. We blame everything on society. We blame everything on this, this fictional thing that's out there somewhere that absorbs all our guilt and we're not responsible anymore. I'm just a little person. It's their fault. No, it's your fault. And on the day of judgment, it will come out. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, that man will reap. What a child sows, that child will reap. And you won't be able to blame it on parents or teachers or society or anything else. It will be you standing before God. And for some of you, with no advocate, with no defense. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. You're standing now. You didn't respect then. You'll respect now. And he says this, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Look at verse 13, the last part. They were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. What is he trying to say? He's saying, wake up, listen, listen. You can talk all day about you're a good person and you're not as bad as this person and everything else. But if you will just listen according to your deeds, you will be judged. If I could pull your heart out right now and put everything you have ever thought on some sort of video screen behind me and show it to the people, you would run out of this building and you would never show your face here again because you have thought things so low, so base, so vile that you would do anything to keep people from knowing it. And yet we're just like you. So how will you stand on that day when the one who judges you isn't like you? But absolute holiness. Oh, dear friend, listen, listen, listen. I beg you, listen. Homeschool child who looks at public school and says, I'm not like that. Listen to me. Listen to me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Judged by your deeds. There's books. And then there's a book. Books. And then a book. The plural in Hebrew. I know this is written in Greek. But the Hebrew idea carries through. With John. The books. Many, many books. Why? Every deed ever done. Every thought, every word from Adam to the last man in his last moment. Every thought, every word, every deed, every attitude of your own in those books. That's why there's so many, so extensive. And those books are compared to one book. Not as large. Remember what Jesus said, the warning, the road is narrow, the gate small, few are those who find it. Because many will come before me on that day and say all sorts of things he said, but I'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, you go, you go, well, 
I know Jesus. Sorry. If I were to go to the White House and try to enter through the gate, they would stop me. And if I said, I know the president, they would laugh. It would only be until the president came out and said, I know him that I'm going to pass. You say you know Jesus. Does Jesus know you? And when he says, depart from me, I never knew you. The word no, again, taking from the Hebrew idea, though written in Greek, the idea is basically this. Jesus is going to look at you and you say, and say what? I, I knew you. And Jesus goes, we didn't talk together. We didn't walk together. We didn't fellowship together throughout your life. You didn't study my word and submit your life to it. You didn't call on me for power. We didn't. We had nothing on earth. But I prayed that prayer. What? You prayed a prayer. Really. Really. You prayed a magical prayer. We are saved only by faith. It is grace and grace alone. But if you have truly believed in Christ, your heart has also been regenerated. It's been made new. And that heart is going to want to have fellowship with Christ. And if your heart like mine, it's going to lament and be broken when it doesn't want Christ as it ought to. I want you to understand something. A Christian is not just known for his apparent victory. I would say more so the Christian is known for his or her brokenness. They want to be more for Jesus. And they lament when they're not. The unconverted church member could care less. I've got Jesus in my pocket. I said the prayer. Do you see? So which books will judge you? Which books? The one that have all your deeds? Or the single book where your name is written? Which one? So are you good now? I'm good. If you died, where would you go? Heaven. Why? Well, I'm pretty good. Are you good now? No, you're not. If you're judged by those books. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But if your name is found in that one book, it doesn't matter if you were the greatest of all sinners. It doesn't matter. Drug dealer, murderer, prostitute, or even worse, self-righteous religious person. But if now you have Christ and Christ has you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And then he says in verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. Imagine bodies at the bottom of the sea. Awakened. Imagine those in hell. Called forth and imagine all of them. The one in the sea clinging to the reef of the sea saying, no, leave me here, leave me here, leave me here. The one in hell clinging to his own chains. No, let me hold on to these chains. Do not bring me forth. Do not make me stand before him. But the dead will be called forth. All of them. The righteous to eternal life. The unrighteous, those who would not have Christ to eternal condemnation. Isn't it amazing that they would rather cling to the hot rocks of hell and beg not to be brought up 
than to stand in his presence. It's like when I was a little boy and we would go fishing and we would turn over rocks and logs and look for crickets and beetles and worms. And the moment the light would come in under that rock, all those little creatures squirming, trying to dig deeper and deeper and deeper to get away from the light. But there'll be no getting away. When he says, come, they come. They come. And the sea gave up the dead which were in them, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Oh, if only, if only you would hear that one part. If only God would grant you mercy to look in the inner chambers of your heart with this one phrase, I will be judged according to everything in my heart, according to every word I have spoken, according to every deed, I will be judged. And remember this, Adam and Eve took the bite from a fruit and it condemned the entire world. You have sinned more times in heart and deed and word than you could ever count with a supercomputer. Fifteen. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, here's something that I would like to share with you. People always say, well, I could understand if there was judgment for a certain period of time. But how can it be that hell's eternal? I mean, eternal punishment. How could it be that way? And sometimes theologians will answer it and say, God is of infinite glory. He's of infinite worth. Therefore, any disobedience against him is worthy of infinite punishment. And that is true. But there's some, something much deeper you need to understand. See, you're assuming that the people in hell, you're assuming they're repentant. What you've got to understand is it just as the West, the United States, Canada and Europe, just as the West has now been turned over to reprobation. So it does things in public that is absolutely unthinkable just a few years ago. And they would rather rot and wallow in their sin. They delight in it. They weep with joy over it. Because they've been turned over. Now imagine those in hell turned over completely. It's just like when we used to go in and try to pull drug addicts out of what we called huecos in Peru. Holes. Try to pull them out and try to get them the gospel, get them food. They were miserable. They were tearing at their flesh. They had so many holes in their arms. They were infested with lice and eaten by rats. But you couldn't drag them out of that hole. I would submit to you it's very possible that men are so turned over in hell to their own sin and their own hatred that if Christ were to come down to the gates of hell, throw them open wide and say, every one of you who desires to come out, come out but only to worship me, fall and acknowledge who I am. They would run to the gates of hell and they would slam them shut and say, we'd rather rot in hell than worship you. Such is the hatred of man for God. Where are you? I don't want to ask, where will you be? That's too late. Where are you now? Do you know him? Do you know this one who died and rose again on your behalf? Do you see that God so loved the world that he gave his only son? What is love? Self-giving. He gave himself, his son, God himself in human flesh, absorbed the wrath of God that you deserve and I deserve. So that none of this has to happen. None of it. None of it. None of it. Come to Christ. Trust in Him. 
I would tell you, run to Christ. And if you say, I'm too weak to run, then walk to Christ. You say, I'm too weak to walk, crawl to Christ. You say, I cannot crawl to Christ. Hang on, Christ. I cannot hang on Christ. Then just fall upon Christ. Fall upon him. Quit in your righteousness. Give up on any form of righteousness you might think that you possess. Any inward righteousness, any work, any deed. See it as the filth it is and just fall upon Christ. Those who come to him, he will not cast out. He is powerful and mighty and desirous to save. If any of you go to hell, you will not be able to blame it on the providence of God. It was your own doing. Come unto me, he said, all who are weary and heavy laden. Those who come to him, he said, I will in no, I will no wise cast out. All you have to see is your need of him. Your need of him. And then for those of you who are believers. I am now older. It seems like yesterday. I was in my 20s and running around the jungle. Now I'm 61 and I'm very tired. Do you realize if I had gained the whole world by now. What a miserable little man I would be. My best years are behind me. My strength is going almost every day. I would have nothing, even if I possessed the whole world. But now, every day that I grow weaker and my heart beats slower, I'm getting closer and closer to home. Young person, listen to me. I do not regret anything I gave him. I only regret what I held back. Dear Jim Elliot, he is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep, to gain that which he can never lose. Give your heart to Christ. Give your hands, give your body, give everything to Christ. But more than that, take Christ. Take Christ. Forsaking your own righteousness, trust in him. And what is so amazing, here I am now, Paul the aged, 40 years serving him. And let's say that five minutes from now, you're converted and you trust in Christ. And a minute later, he comes. I praise God we have the same standing before him. (laughs) Because when there's when the first is last and the last is first, there's no first or last. No more competition, no more ranking children of God and one hero, not Spurgeon, not Calvin. Not the Puritans, not the reformers, one hero, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord God, that you would use it in the heart of people, that they would be converted even tonight. That they would be troubled and not let go of. Until they come to you joyfully. Receiving, Lord, that uh, that manna, that drink, that bread for free. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're actually going to sing another hymn, uh, All I Have is Christ. And while we're standing in a moment, those who are on the aisles in bucket seats, those seats will be taken just so that there's then space to get out at the end. But what a great sermon, what a great reminder on that great day when you're asked, what do you have? And if you say, well, I've got a good reputation, I was an environmental warrior, I was a social justice individual, uh, I was a moral person, I was as honest as most people in my neighborhood, I was as hard a worker as you get, you're going to be told you've got nothing. But if you say, all I have is Christ, you're going to be told, well done, 
my good and faithful servant. What a thrill to have Christ tonight. What a saviour, what a friend. Stand with me as we sing. Before you go, I would beg you, I would beg you, if you're not with Christ, I would beg you, I would beg you to come to somebody, your parents or pastor or friend, say, I'm not right with him. Please, please don't, don't go to hell. Don't reject salvation. I remember when he saved me. Such a wretch. So bad. I don't care what you've done. I'm not the... I'm the... I was so bad. He can cleanse you of everything that you have done. He can give you a new life. So please, do not leave here. Trust in him. Throw yourself upon him. Get someone to counsel you tonight. Please, please. Amen. Amen. Trust in Jesus. Oh, well, you are dismissed, but may the word of God go on with you and burn in your heart and may the gospel set you free because that's what it does it sets sinners free thank you for coming thank you paul for preaching amen <laughs> <laughs>